our subject and our focus today will be on faith again. We're continuing our teaching on faith and I'm telling you, you need to buckle your seats. You know, when you keep reading the scriptures and keep seeking God, the word multiplies and explodes in front of you, boom, over and over again. And you say, I read that before, but no, you, didn't re you read it and understood. We read it and understood what our spirit would give us then because we were not ready for the everything else. Now, we went through scriptures two weeks ago, and we looked at the book of Hebrews, and we, you, had a, you had a paper. I don't know if you're taking it home to study or not, but if you did, I know you'll probably write, along with me, 1038, where God says the righteous one shall live by faith, and we shrink back. He has no pleasure in us. We also looked at Habakkuk 2.4. Where the word of God says, my righteous one shall live by faith. And we looked at Romans 117, where the scripture says that Jesus did the work and the righteous one shall live by faith again. And then we moved into James, uh, book of James, chapter 2. And we began with verse 14. And... went through that, but we'll start there again now, because we've got a lot of verses to cover. So let's keep up. Where in James 2.14, James writes, we're for faith and works. You know, faith and works, I'm going to say it up front, faith and works are twins a husband and wife, and they join together and they become one. That's a good example. Faith and works, a husband and wife, and when they join together inside of us, they become one. Now, that's the first time I ever said that. Holy Ghost gave me that. But the scripture says, what use is it, my brother, if someone says he has faith, but he has no work? Can faith save him? The answer to that is no. If a brother or sister is without clothing and need and in need of a daily food, and one says, one of you say to them, God is in peace, be go in peace, brother, be warm and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body. What use is that? Now, here James is explaining the word where someone just holler, I got faith. But yet, in the natural, you just do, we're just doing a bunch of yin yang, what we talk, a bunch of talking. Then he goes on and says, even so, faith, if it has no works, is what? Dead. Being by what? itself. So I can have all faith that I, and I can sit around and say, I do have faith, but if there's no works, I don't have faith. That faith is dead Amen. because I'm not doing anything to activate or live out my faith. So if a husband tells a wife that I love you and we're married, but never do anything for the wife, or the wife never do anything for the husband. They just, one sleep upstairs, one sleep downstairs, cook their own meals separate, or they're married. They go and do all what they want to do, and just do, never meeting the needs of the other. Are they married? Is there a marriage? Well, the same way faith is. And he goes on and says, But someone may well say, you have faith, and I have works. 
and show me your faith without the works, and I will show you my faith by my works. And notice what he said. Show me your faith without the works, and I'm going to show you my faith by my works. Now, a person who just has faith has no works, because what they had was dead. And nothing from nothing does what? Nothing plus nothing gives you what? Simply because you say, I believe God, doesn't mean that you have faith in God. And we're going to go into James where James point that out. Even the demons believe God. But not one of them will serve him. So we have billions of people who know that God is. And we have billions of people that would never serve God. Are they sons of God? Do they have faith in God? Obviously not. And so we're looking here to where James again is beginning to tell us that there's a difference. But if you do have faith then, and you work your faith, as God says, faith is the what? Substance. There is a substance to what? Faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped far, and there's some evidence, a conviction. Remember Fred Price used to holler all the time on his program? Evidence? You remember his program? What's, what's your life saying? What kind of evidence are there? That tells what kind of faith is there. You, you, you can go on the street, or you can go in the, to, uh, I go talk to a lot of people, and I'm and they find out on a minister, they go, oh, man, I believe God. I said, when the last time you've been to church, man? I ain't going to no church. I, last time I went to church back in 1942. And the preacher did this. And I ain't been back since, so I can go to heaven on my own. I said, you're going straight to hell. I'm not, see, I'm not going to hold my tongue anymore. Because he just violated the word of God. He violated Hebrews. God says, do not forsake yourself for going to church. And then he became the judge of the teacher, and he doesn't know anything about the Bible at all. And if I don't know anything about God, am I going to get in heaven? If I have not surrendered to Jesus Christ, am I going to get in? Remember, Jesus says, unless you come to me as a what? Child. And he says, unless you give up your life, you shall what? Lose it. So if I'm not willing to change, I am operating in witchcraft. I am totally in rebellion. Let's say that again. God says rebellion is a what? It is, is the sin of what? Witchcraft and insubordination. I will not submit to God. I will rebel against God. And I will rebel against his word. We have no excuse because all of us have a Bible. We have no excuse because we can ask Jesus to come in our heart and fill us with the Holy Ghost. We have no excuse because there are two or three churches on every block. Amen? Isn't it on TV? Can't you get any sight on the internet? Can't you get any in sight on your cell phone? You can pick up your phone now and ask any Bible question to pop right up in your face. What excuse do I have to stick into my own way? Now, he goes on and he says, you believe that God is one, you do well. Now watch it, look it in your Bible. And this is the brother of Jesus. <laughs> now watch. You believe that God is what? One. You do well. Now watch what it says. The demons also believe, and at least they shudder. Demons got more sense than you. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, you, 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 you believe God's one, but you won't do nothing. But at least demons are scared. Somebody said amen. amen. Demons know who God is. And remember they would get scared every time Jesus would show up? You notice they would get scared every time Paul or Peter showed up? Are they getting scared when you show up? Yes. Because the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost, you, you empower, you go in a room, people will turn and begin to act. They, they, they get scared. They want to fight you. They, they don't want to hear nothing you got to say. Then you know you're filled with the Holy Ghost. But if you walk in there and, hey, bro, how are you doing and all that kind of stuff, and you jump, here, take a beer. And mothers, I want to tell you something. Your children, if they don't have the Holy Ghost, will hate you. Stop grieving over the devil. You are no longer responsible for their souls. God will deal with them. And you worship God, God tell you what he will do to them. You might not be around to see it, but it will happen. You can want them to come to heaven. If they do, you're not going to know them anyway. Don't you allow yourself to be pulled down by your family. Jesus says, I've come to set mother against daughter, father, and our brothers and sisters against, didn't he? Then why in the world can we accept that and say worrying about our children? You did the same thing to your parents too. God took care of you. I mean, I was a little devil. I don't know about you. Before I was born again, I was a little devil. And my parents loved God, and they, they tried to keep me from doing things, but I had to go and follow the path that was set before me. So it says, but you are willing, <laughs> you, you, demon, demon Shelley, but you are willing to recognize you foolish fellas. <laughs> that faith without works is useless. See, we have to recognize that faith without works is useless. And they said in the church, who always talk about faith? You know, Pastor Lucy and I used to go to conferences where it was all faith people, supposedly. And those people did more sin than the heathen on the street. They would say things that was anti-God. They would preach things that was anti-God. And live by things that was anti-God. But when they got together at a conference, it was just like going to a hoot now. And all they want to do is trick you and get your money. Hallelujah. Let's go on. Now notice 21, it says, Was not Abraham the father, our father justified? By what? Works. Question, was not Abraham our father justified by what? When he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar. You see that faith was working with his works. And as a result of the works, faith was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, also Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him by God, by the Most High, who reckons unto us. It was reckoned to him, right, as what? Righteous. And he was called the what? Friend of God. 
And what we want to do is pick up the scripture in the New Testament, right here, that Paul wrote just as well, that says that we have been made righteous through Christ. And we say, use that as an excuse to sit in a rocking chair and do nothing. We make that an excuse not to go out and win souls. We make that as an excuse to make think that we can argue and fight against those that are in leadership that God appoints. We make that as a means to say, I can do what I want to do. No. If your works is of the devil, and the devil was in heaven, and he was the, 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 the uh, uh, third, one of the three most powerful angels, and he was God's worshiper, and he had all the instruments in him, and he knew God, and he stood before God, and before all of heaven, and he himself decided that I am greater than him, I'm going to lift myself above the most high. First one to start rebellion against God. And he convinced one third of the angels to rebel with him. And that's where man gets his rebellion against the leadership in the church today. And he don't realize that it's all Satan influence. And remember when your Savior came from heaven. And he were first filled with the Holy Spirit coming out of the water. And God declared, this is my beloved son, whom I am well pleased. The first place he went was out into the wilderness to be tempted by who? Satan. And Satan tempted him in every way, and he used a phrase. that we should pay very much attention to today. He says, if you would fall down, if you would fall down from where you are because you're filled with God, you're the son of God, if you would fall down and worship me because I'm already fallen, I was thrown out of heaven, I'll give you all these things. And so the day the devil comes to us in other patterns, in other ways. But that's what he tells us. If you would just stay out of church and work hard, you're going to make some money. If you would just take your time and work over here and do this and do that and leave God's stuff alone, then you can survive and you can live. You have a nice car, nice house and everything, and you're going to be high in the community. Oh! Oh, Lord, my God, those cars get old. Those payments get hard laid on. And all of us who are 70 and above know that you can work as hard as you want to. And you'll never have nothing. Because you seek money, it will flee from you. That's God's word. Where is my faith in the works of God without Doing nothing. And so we find that James is talking to you and I in a way that we should be able to understand. That Abraham was made a friend of God, not because God decided that Abraham was righteous, but Abraham proved because he believed God that he was righteous. Because he says, my son, the only, it took me over 100 years to get this son that you told me I was going to have. But Lord God, you said to kill him and offer him up to your sacrifice. There's nothing greater than your works. And he took him up and built an altar, made him carry his own altar on his back. And, and, and his son laid there because he had faith too. And he didn't argue against his daddy. He, he just laid down there. And Abel picked up the, his knife, pulled it back, and God said, don't you dare. Hallelujah. I mean, he had already killed him because his faith had already worked. Hallelujah. And he was declared to be righteous. Right. And how is our righteousness in Jesus? And when I say Jesus, in the beginning was the what? In the beginning was the what? And the word was? And the word was? 
And the word became alive and lived. John, uh, John 1 14. Jesus became alive and lived in, among us, the word. And so today, what's my righteousness? How am I dealing with God? Or am I playing a game and fooling myself that I'm going to get in the kingdom? You know, every time I read the verse where Jesus says, and when he's on his, his, his judgment seat, and man come before him and says, didn't I do this and didn't I do that in your name? Get away from me. Didn't did I do this in your name? And didn't I do that in your name? And God says, get away from me. I never knew you. I never really get, could understand why would he never know him? If they, because they never did anything for God. They did it for themselves for sure. Have you considered the rich young ruler that came to Jesus and said, what shall I do to get saved? I followed the law all my life from I was a child. And he come to Jesus and he says, and Jesus, and he says, I paid my tithes, I paid my offense, I did everything that the law said do. What must I do? Because he knew he wasn't saved. And Jesus told him, you've done well. But one thing that you lack, You don't have a given heart. You stole from people to get your riches. Take it and give it to the poor. You turn your nose to the poor, take your riches and give it to the poor. And he walked away and said, I'd rather go to hell. And that's the way most of us are. We got, we got, we got a line that we are not going to cross for God. I said we have lines that we're not going to cross for God. What line have you set up? What line have you set up for going and encouraging a brother at church? Your job is to go to church in Hebrews and encourage the brother because everybody's catching hell. Everybody, those people who are righteous, and love God, there, there, there are few of them together. Remember the road is what? Narrow. And what? Straight. And few are those that are finding it. And fewer are those that will enter through the gate. And those who enter through the gate can go in and come out in time to get ready. According to Jesus. So, these so those folk who really love God and live holy, there are few of them. They're like the disciples had to gather together and exalt one another. Yes. You are going to have to live the same way. Yes. And if you don't want to do that, then you're in the wrong church. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes. It's up to you. There's a way to live righteous. And if you read Hebrews, and just allow God to talk to you. Don't just read Hebrews 11, 1 through 6 and just stop. Read the other part of the evil, the awful lives that the people had to live in serving Jesus Christ. There are thousands of them. Thousands. And he said, if I keep on writing about all of them, there's no room for the book. Let us stop hollering faith and we don't have it. We have no works. And the scriptures were fulfilled. Which, and this is 23. Which says, And Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see, now watch it, that a man is justified by what? Works. Is that in your Bible? Have you read that before? How much work are you doing for the Lord? Or have you retired? You get to the right age, 65. Who said that? Come on, tell me 
in the Bible where you see 65? It's not in there, is it? When I'm at 65, I can give up my ministry. When I'm 65, I can go ahead and sit down in my rocking chair and get my social security check. You didn't live up on a social security check up to now. Why you set God aside? God's your bank. Don't tell me you got faith. And God supply all your needs according to your riches, his riches in glory, and you're going to sit down and limit yourself to a social security check. And we talked last week with a name Anna, the one that was in the temple. Hannah. Anna, yes. And she was in her 80s, 90s, and never missed one day of coming in the church praying all the time for Jesus to come. And God told her that she would be there. And she was there every day. All, she's lived in the sanctuary. We. And she was in her 90s. And then the man who came, the other pastor who came, whom God told you can't die until you circumcise the one. And he was over 100 years old and his time came and he, he waited, but yet he wouldn't, we wouldn't have done anything. We would have went and got a wheelchair and, and set aside and said, Lord, I'm dying. Let me say some of us. I want to put us all in there. God has a ministry for you. And it's not going to work until you learn to submit yourself to someone who can help guide you. If you can't submit yourself to one who you see, you never can commit yourself to one you don't see. Jesus submitted himself to John the Baptist. He never one time went out ministering until he submitted himself to John the Baptist. The Holy Ghost never came on him until he went to be submitted to John the Baptist. And John the Baptist washed over him. Remember John the Baptist was in jail? Come on, y'all. Holy Ghost talking to you. John the Baptist was in jail to get his head cut off. And he sent workers, to his disciples to Jesus and asked him what was going on. And Jesus told him, you go back and tell them the works that I do out here. Tell them about the works. People being raised from the dead. People being healed and all that. Why did Jesus report that? Because John the Baptist would know what God told him in heaven was taking place. He anointed the right one. Baptized the right one. Lord, saints, it's time for you to grow. God wants you to get up and grow. You can't be a baby forever. There's no milk being poured out in the sanctuary. Come on, let's read some more. I've got a few minutes. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. And get that scripture straight. In the same way was not Rahab the harlot. Here come the woman. Rahab what? The harlot. Also justified by what? Works. When she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. For just as the body is without the spirit is dead. So is faith without works is what? Dead. I can't say it no better. The Apostle James said it a whole lot better than I can say it. I, can't, I cannot say that any better. James said it better. I don't think Pastor Lucille can say that any better. I don't think any man or woman can say that any better. It's only God. 
In fact, I want you to also look back before I go. James 2, 22. That's just going back to the original page on the other side over there. James 1, 22, I'm sorry. James says in 1, 22, but prove yourself doers of the word. Word. Doers of what? And not mere what? Hearers. Who delude themselves. Delude mean the fool. Make a fool out of yourself. Now, how do we do that? How do we, can we understand how one can do that? I can see why I've done it. Because flesh, flesh is difficult. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, we read in the same Bible. If I don't sing line. Yeah. He is like a man who looks at his natural face in the mirror. Right? You look at everybody have looked in the mirror, right? And most of the time we don't like what we see. But that's us anyway. Hallelujah. But for once he has looked at himself and gone away. He has immediately forgotten of what kind of a person he was. That's the flesh. I don't remember what I looked like 10 minutes after I be the mirror. I don't know about you. Do you? When I get dressed, and put all my, pass, I'm getting ready. And put all my smell me good on. And y'all know what smell me good is. That's cologne for guys. Just, I used to grow up with a guy who put cologne on. And he, he and I would live, grow up picking in cotton fields and stuff together. And he would go to get ready for his son. He said, I put my son, my son, the, uh, what he used to call, son the duds on. And put my smell me good on. So, now, that has stuck with me over the years. You know, guys have slapped a little. You guys know what I'm talking about? I, I put my smell me good on and put my tie on and my shirt on. I think I don't look like the guy that was in the mirror. And sometimes you think you're younger than you are until you go and look in the mirror. And some of us who are seven zero and Ola, who lived our three scores and ten, begins, ah, who's that? Well, you got 120 years. And you know one thing? I'm leaving Pastor. I have to tell him today. Pastor Lucille and I have been preaching 120 years for 30 years, because that's what God said. Two days ago, the Lord woke me up, and I went across the hall, past Lucy was asleep, and I turned the TV on and says, I prayed, I had been praying for maybe two or three hours, and I moved across the hall, turned the TV on, and there comes this guy first, this teaching revelation, at five o'clock in the morning. Then here comes a guy from Texas with his cowboy duds on. You know who I'm talking about. He, he and his wife been on doing TV. And he was sitting up there talking about, you might think you're old, but you ain't old because of 120 years. For 30 years, I have never heard that prophet talk about 120 years of age. And he finally got the revelation. He says, I got my 120 years. My next birthday, I'm going to be 80 years of age. And I got that thing down in my heart, in my spirit, my faith is on that, that God has given me 120 years. 
And I tell you, I feel better than I did 20 years ago. I'm in better physical shape than I was 20 years ago because I realized that God gave me 120 years and I'm sticking to that and I'm going to be here for a long time. Come on, Pastor. If God doesn't allow you to make it, that's all right too, but you got that loan. Maybe sin might cut you off. But he says that in his word. Praise the Lord. I tell you, you don't know who's listening to you on YouTube. You don't know who's, who you're blessing. I've heard some things that God revealed to new life to Pastor Raph and I that I never heard until. And you know what? We always learn from one another. Sometimes we don't want to receive what the word says. I say what the word says, not what Pastor Raph and Pastor Lucille and all the other uh, five, four ministry people or the other people that tell you. They don't want to believe it. But if it's written, it's so. My mother was in her 80s and everybody was dying and she said, well, I guess I'm going to have to leave here because all my friends and everybody I went to school with passed away, so I'm the only one. And I told her, I said, listen, you got 120 years. That got down in her spirit. And she 94 and ain't planning on going nowhere. Getting up now, getting ready to go outside and see some sun. She's been in all went along. She's ready to go. And I said, I'm coming to take you out. She said, well, when are you coming? Is it going to be two weeks before you get here? She wanted me to come today. But uh, she's 94. And uh, she believes 120. I tell you when you, when I look at you all and I see your faith, and I hope everybody else see your faith. I hope everybody else see your works. But some people just can't believe that you are who you are. They can't believe that you have the faith that you have. Some of us have that faith that no matter what happens, I'm going to do what God says. Then we have some people, they won't do what God says. They got a little bit of flesh, a little bit of world in them. But I tell you today, the Bible says, as Paul says, be of me as I am of Christ. You see in front of you people that are committed to God, that have committed to God, faithful to God, well over 30 years. You can see God in them. You can see their faithfulness. You can see their obedience and understand why they live as long as they do. Understand why they're as prosperous as they are. Understand no matter how I feel, I'm going to serve God with whatever strength I have. But yet we can look at people and see fault, but we can also look and see faith. Then we can look at others, and their faith is not where it needs to be because they don't spend a whole lot of time in the Word. But let me tell you something. When God shows up, when you put a house in order, the Holy Ghost shows up. When you're chastened discipline, the Holy Ghost will show up. He'll stay out if you allow anything to happen. But when you get your house in order, the anointing comes, Holy Spirit is here. He will not be in the midst of division or strife. But he'll come when his word is being performed. Now I look at people that have been here not only this church, but the other churches too, faithful people that have been faithful unto God, realizing how 
prosperous they are, in their bodies, at the age they are, knowing God is keeping them because they're faithless unto God. It might look like they're sick, look like they're something, but everything is all right. I say sometimes that we can't look at something and say it's one way. The person that looked the sickest is the one that outlived you. Y'all have seen that happen in the past. So when you are young and you, you need to serve the Lord because you just might not make it to be 70 to 75 or 76. I think the Lord has allowed me to live as long as I've lived and to be as healthy as I am because when I preach, I preach for God. When I worship, I worship for God. It's God. You get it, but it's God. Everything we do is for God. Not for anybody else. But God takes it. And he allows it to bless you. But it's him doing the teaching. It's him doing everything. The worship is to God. Not to people. We worship God. Even if we're singing a song about somebody. It's worshiping God. We sing unto the Lord is to God. We preach it to God. It's all about God, not about ourselves. The Bible tells us that we are aliens. We're here on the earth for one reason, and that is to try to get as many people saved as we can, try to get as many people to God as we can. Through him, we can't do it, but God can. I look at myself and I say, Lord, after 30 years, and I know you said the same thing, it's the same battle, but the battle is the Lord's. And sometimes we, we see things going on and we need to ask ourselves, what would God do about it? What, what did God's word say about it? What does God's word say about what I'm hearing? Is it God that I'm obeying or is it man? You know, when something comes before you, if you get your Bible and read it, you'll know it's God. I heard somebody say the other day when Moses was leading the people uh, out of uh, slavery, out of bondage, when they didn't get, when they, when they, when they turned the world back to the wilderness, they blamed Moses because they went back to the wilderness. It's always somebody else's fault of why I didn't make it to the promised land. And when they grumble against Moses, they grumble against God. When they said, Moses, you caused this, they told God that they caused this. Because as I said, it wasn't Moses doing it, it was God. Hello? He was doing what God told him to do. He was an instrument of God. And he was not doing what he wanted to do, but what God says to do. Anytime that you are ministering, it is what God wants, not what you want. When you are witnessing someone, you see somebody in error, it is your responsibility to remind them as to what God says. If you are a disciple, if you are the Christian that you say you are, you remind your brethren what they are doing wrong. And the Bible says all the ones, supposed, all the women are supposed to teach the younger ones. Don't let them fall. Don't let them stumble. If you have the faith that you should have, you would have faith enough to be able 
to carry the word. Because that's our job. So if we have faith in God, whom we've never seen, why do we have faith in God? We have not seen him, but we know that he is. And so when we look at the word and see what the word says, we know it's God's word because he said it, didn't he? And the scriptures talks about faith, how Abraham had faith, how Isaac had faith, how Joseph had faith, how Moses had faith, and how Rahab had faith. And here we are today with faith. Here we are in the new covenant. Have a better covenant than they had. And yet our works are not what they are supposed to be. And I remember when Pastor Ralph was doing uh, an interpretation, um, I was thinking about how God talked to the Jews. And now he said, what he's going to do to them, they're going to do this and do that. And it just brought me back to that because nowadays when, when that goes forth, it's like, People don't want to hear anything about what I'm not doing. But he sure told them what they wasn't doing. And told them their punishment. When, I want to leave this to you today. When you hear the word, you are responsible to go back and read it. And when you read it, you're supposed to believe it. Because it's God's word. We don't go around trying to find somebody going to tickle our ears, but we're trying to find the word. And when we find that, we need to believe it. That's your faith. But if we're looking for error, we're never going to find the truth. The truth is, hold your Bible up. Oh, y'all have Bibles. The truth is in the word. If someone tells you something and it's in the word, you need to believe it. But sometimes we don't hear. Sometimes we sit and we don't hear what's being taught, therefore we can't activate the word because most of the time we're not hearing what God is saying. And I say what God is saying because when somebody's teaching you the word, I don't care who it is, if you're listening, you'll go back and read it. I, many times I've, taught, I've seen pastors and I've listened to the word, and I would go back and read it. And God will give you the knowledge, revelation of it. If you are born again. If you can't, if you can't, if God ain't revealing to you, then there's something wrong. Because the secret you shall find, knocking the door be open. If you're reading the Bible and you can't understand it, then, then the revelation isn't given to you. You need to begin to pray. Because he will give you a revelation of his word. But you find people with their faith, instead of doing the works, they'll run around and try to find fault in everybody. And when you do that, you need to point your hand right back at you. Right? Because they're fault in everybody. There's not a man on this earth, not a woman on this earth that's got it right. I was reading the scripture that Pastor Ralph and I was reading the other day. And I read the scripture, and I said, look at this. And he says, he told me what the revelation knowledge that we got from the scripture. I went back and read it again and got another revelation. The first one wasn't wrong, but there was another revelation. Y'all know what I'm talking about? You can get this interpretation from this, but the, as you grow, there's so many interpretations of that same scripture that you don't know. And God will reveal it to you on down the line. But that one scripture don't just mean just that one thing. 
The Holy Ghost up. Every time you read it, you get something different out of it. Because it's the Holy Ghost teaching. Oh, but this is what that means. Wait a minute. You keep reading it. How many can vouch for that? You keep reading it, something else is going to come up in that scripture. And you keep on reading it, keep on reading it, you're going to find God's going to reveal more. It's not going to contradict what you, what you read, but it's going to add more to it. And the only way you're going to get that faith is to begin to read the word of God and be open. Don't just shut yourself out the way. This is where I believe in da-da-da-da. I believe this, I believe this, and I don't believe nothing else but this. Come on. The Bible says study. What do you say? Study what? So you can what? Said and show yourself approved. So you can do what? Rightly by the word of truth? Steady, steady, steady. Every time I just don't want nobody to go to hell myself. I don't, I don't want to see nobody go to hell. I do not want to see anybody go to hell. I don't, I don't have a life on this earth, life that some people think they have. I just want to do what God says do and get out of here. Because I tell you, when you look, if you ain't careful, you'll find people in the church worse than the one outside. I know Bible says you ain't supposed to say it, but I'm telling you the truth. We have to activate our faith and do work because I'm telling you that God got some folks out there that ain't sitting in here. That believe God and live somehow better than some of us. They will reverence God when you won't. They'll drink looking when they see a pastor. Excuse me, Pastor. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Nah, they don't even respect him at all. I remember that. They they were taught. Today we're not taught like that. We're taught we can do anything. I used to sit up in the church and I better not open my mouth. When you walked in there, you didn't, you didn't, you didn't, you didn't walk when somebody would preach. Somebody said, well, you know, no, see, some of these people got their own way of doing things now. They don't do it the way God do it. It's the way we want to do it to keep from hurting somebody's feelings. I used to come to the church door and they praying that Usher with that white thing on would hold you at that door. And you wouldn't go nowhere. Them doors wouldn't open until that person got through praying. But now they just walk right on through. You be praying, they'll walk right through and don't pay no attention to you. They'll do anything in the church. Well, you got all week long here. We only ask you three hours in here. Well, if you leave out of here, do what you need to do. When you're in here, you need to act like you're in the presence of the Lord. I, I, you know, I ain't got time for nobody to love me. I want you, if you love Jesus, you love me. Right? And I ain't tickling no ears because I don't have to. I, I, I just have to be in there with the angels and wish them the angels and I'm going to float on up to heaven and leave everybody here. But uh, we have to make sure that we go back to the training that we were taught when we were children that how we need to come into the church because they had a whole lot of that right. And we just do anything. And that's going to change. My grandmother used to set up and when she couldn't go to church, she'd turn her favorite TV, uh, television on and she'd sit right there in that chair like Lenora sit right there wouldn't move till it was over. And you better not bother her because she was in the presence of the Lord. 
and she was not even in the church but that was her church to sit there and not move and you didn't bother her when she was sitting there in that chair that's how you get your healing when you don't put no flesh in bar you just sit there But America people, they got to the point, we just do anything we want to do. And uh, it'll be all right. God's got to, and people have trained people to do that, so. They see it going on in so many places, and when they do come to a place where you reverence God, it ain't like that anymore. But the Lord is 